everyone. Everywhere. Engaging in. Eternity. This is the truth. It's the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church will last forever and ever. I'm talking about the church. Why would we as parents, as the professors of our family university, shy away from teaching and training our children about the most important thing that they could ever know and understand what a relationship with God is all about? We can grow. We can share our lives together. We can go out and do the work that God wants us to do. It's not our God who is able, it is our God whom we serve. Jesus said, put a new song in our mouth and praise in our heart and others will see what the Lord has done for us and glorify God. Providence is the working of the details of your life and mine. Providence is knowing that God is orchestrating the details of our days and our lives and our encounters and our opportunities that he's actually ordering our footsteps. God isn't just interested in getting you to do something. He wants you to understand that he sees you just like you are and right where you are and he loves you and his prayer for you is that you let him set you free in these days. There are people out there who are gonna try and take your hope from you, but you gotta hold on to it and realize if God spoke a vision and a future into your heart, no person can take that away from you. You don't allow that to happen. You let hope rise in your spirit because that's what Jesus puts inside every one of us. I'm gonna stand up for Jesus no matter what the cost. P3 2020 is coming fast. We want you to save the date. February 19th and 20th, we have 100 tickets pre-purchased just for you. We've already got 50 hotel rooms booked out right next door, and that's because we believe in getting on the road, connecting with one another, spending time with one another, and allowing God to download from the most amazing speakers in the nation into your lives. So... No excuses. Every excuse is equal. They produce the same results. Don't make excuses. You're four months out. Now's your opportunity. Write it down. Tell your boss. Text I won't your boss be there. right now. Right now? February 19th and 20th. Go through the proper channels to get yourself off. If you are the boss, shut your operation down and Boom. take your people to C3. You think I'm kidding. Uh -uh. If you know me, you know I'm not. February 19th and 20th, you got to go. It's church camp for adults. It's life changing. I, Absolutely, it's life changing. It is church camp for adults. And Dallas will never be the same when you put over 100 mountain movers in their That's cars. Right. And you send them down to Dallas, I promise you, Dallas Make a scene. will never be the same again. That's right. Neither will that hotel. It's going to be crazy. Last year, we took, what, 84, 86? 80, 80 something. Something like that. And we made a scene. So this year, we, did. we never go back. We always go forward. It is so much fun, guys. That's right. I'm serious. You, you better get there. I'm just That's saying. That's right. Um, okay. So uh, we have some, another guest speaker. I'm just thinking about C3. Honestly, I'm just thinking about C3. Getting all jacked up. I'm getting jacked right now. up. Maybe three cups of coffee had something to do with it. All right. And an energy drink. Um, we have another special guest coming next week. We have, you know, last week we had Brandon Kelly. How many of you guys think he did an incredible job bringing the word of God to the house? That's right. Open your windows. He did a, he did a great job. And so, you know, this last summer at camp, we were able to hear some of our fellow friends highlighted as they brought the Word of God to the students. And I realized, I realized they can preach. And they, they, they love God and they're passionate. And, and they have some great things to share at camp. And I thought, you know, Misty and I looked at each other and we were, we were like, we've got to get some of these guys to come to Mountain Movers and share the fire that is within. And so we had Brandon Kelly last week. Next week we're going to have... An awesome guy by the name of Chad Horton. Chad Horton is, uh, is from the same church as I am. I've known him since about 97. And man, he loves God. He is passionate. 
and I'm not, we don't do smoke or hype or, you know, we don't, we don't just blow things up just to be blowing them up. If I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. Chad is, he loves God and he is on fire and excited about the word of God. So you definitely want to not only be here next week, but you want to make sure you bring some friends as well. It's going to be crazy, crazy, crazy cool. Okay. All right. Today, We are going to, first of all, welcome any of those that maybe it's your first time. You are a newcomer today, but then you're family. And this is a family church. And um, this is a church that is the the perfect church for imperfect people. Uh, No matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've done it with, no matter what your past looks like, no matter what you smell like, no matter what you look like, I'm telling you right now, we are family. You can come just as you are, but as imperfect as we are, isn't it amazing that God still has an appointed plan and purpose for our lives, that he still chooses to use you and I in spite of our imperfections? Isn't that amazing that he uses, he flows through humanity so that he can uh, be revealed to all of mankind. He, he chose you and I that he would flow through us so that people could know him. You see, your purpose for being on this planet is first of all to have a, have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus. And this, here's the second fold part of that, which is contagious. Right. It's supposed to be contagious. We're not supposed to come on Sundays and hear the Word of God and get fat and full and then just remain fat and full on the Word of God and never, sh- never share it, never spread it. We're supposed to be contagious in our hope and in our faith. God's purpose for your life is that you would know Him and secondly, that you would make it known. You know, but there, there is a, um, there's an enemy out there that constantly uses distractions that we call mountains to create these obstructions. They obstruct our view, these mountains. They obstruct our view from being able to see really the horizon ahead of the purpose and the good things that God has in store for us. Scripture says that he's planned these things for us long ago, way before you ever entered into your mother's womb, before you had a name on this earth. God had an incredible plan for you, and he had an appointment for you. He had a reason for you living. Maybe somebody came today, and you need to hear that. He has a reason for you to live right. on this earth. He has a reason for you to be here on this planet. He has a purpose for you. But there's mountains that the enemy likes to set in front of us, these obstructions. They, 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 they create this roadblock where we can't see the good things that God has in store. And today we want to talk to you about one of those so-called mountains. And you'll know why in just a moment why I'm calling it a so-called mountain. But to illustrate this so-called mountain, I want to start with a story. It happened a long time ago. A, an S-4 submarine was just off of the coast of Massachusetts, and it was struck unexpectedly by a ship. And that submarine sank to the bottom of the ocean floor with the crew inside. They dispatched divers to, on a rescue mission. Um, one of the divers was frantically making his way around the outer steel skin of the vessel, trying to find a place uh, where he could maybe find a trap door, something that he could pry open so that he could rescue those who were trapped inside. And as he was searching around the outside of the vessel, he heard very faintly, he heard some tapping uh, that was coming from within the walls of the submarine. And being a sailor himself, he realized that the tapping that he was hearing wasn't just uh, any sort of tapping, but it was actually Morse code. And for those of you that don't know what Morse code is, it's a a coding system that was developed in the 19th century, and and people have used it uh, with light or from from long distances, uh, blinking lights uh, with short or long uh, signals, and each signal... Uh, will will represent a letter in the alphabet, and they can spell out messages with these signals. Sometimes if they don't use light, they, they use sound. And this diver was hearing these taps, and he recognized that it was Morse code. And he leaned his ear up against the outside of the vessel, and he began to just... Uh, process the tapping in his head, and he spelled out the message, which was actually a question that was coming from within. And the question was this, is there any hope? Is there any hope? 
And you know, that, that's a question that you yourself might be asking this morning. Is there any hope? It's a question that a lot of people in your life, a lot of people you come into contact with on a daily basis are asking themselves within their heart, they are asking themselves, is there any right. hope? And you know, so many people live day to day without hope. And, and, and this so-called mountain that we're talking about today is what some would call a mountain of hopelessness. Hopelessness. So many people. You know, every six seconds, a teenager commits suicide. Every six seconds in America, a teenager commits suicide because somewhere along the way, that student felt like there wasn't any hope. Say it, hope. 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 Felt like there was no hope along the way. Somewhere... Some way they convinced themselves that not only, they, they convinced themselves that, that that was their reality and that's just the way things were going to be and that there was no way out. Just within the last 10 days in our community, we've lost two people. Two people to the same lie that they bought into, that there was no As pastors, you know, we get to do funerals from time to time. And it's amazing how when you officiate a funeral and the family, not, not only was the person who passed a believer, but their family is also believers, there's just this unexplainable, silent sense of complete peace. Like your hearts are heavy, but full at the same time. Because everybody knows that one day they're going to see that person again because there's hope. But then there's other funerals that Misty and I have done throughout the years. And I can't even begin to explain that the, the dark, gloomy despair that you sense and you feel when the family, they don't realize the hope that is found in Jesus. And it's, it's one of the most depressing feelings to be in a room full of people who beyond their last breath on this life, in their own mind and in their heart, there's nothing. It makes me think, you know, what, what's, why, why even get up in the morning? Why even roll out of bed? If there's nothing in this world for us to look forward to, if there is no hope, what are we doing here? But as believers, you know, we understand, we get it, that hope isn't a feeling. Hope is a person. That hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is our hope because he lived and he died, but he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the tomb on the third day. The power of God raised him from the dead and he came back to life, overcoming, conquering, bringing victory over death and shame and sin. So now you and I can say no to sin. We can say yes to life. Jesus has given us hope. There's hope. And so since, I'm not going to say if hope exists because I know hope exists. Since hope exists, I want you to think about this. Is there really such thing as hopelessness? No. There's people who haven't accepted hope. Hope is real. It exists. So people that feel in their life that there is no hope, they're they're buying into a lie. It's a scam. The enemy presents this lie that causes us to believe things that are not true. It's a hologram from hell. I I remember when I was seven years old, and we're coming up now, during the time of this recording and these videos, we're coming up on Halloween really quick. And I remember when I was young, I grew up in Kansas City, and, and we had this tradition. It was a stupid tradition. We would go downtown Kansas City, 
and we would go to the haunted houses. I had a brother that was much older than me, sister, six years older than me, and they thought it would be really cool to take their six, seven-year-old brother. I'm thinking, where's mom? Where's yeah. dad? When all of this is happening, who thought this was a good idea to take a seven-year-old to the haunted Terrible houses? Terrible idea. Terrible idea. Terrible idea, parents. The scariest thing about it is just how sketchy it was down there. I'm just saying. It was a rough area. <laughs> you saw some things that most seven-year-olds just should not see. But I remember waiting in line for hours, and we'd go into these nasty haunted houses. And, man, they were scary. I, I wet myself. Um, yeah, I know. It, yeah, oh, feel bad for me. It was bad. Traumatic. I, I needed counseling. Um, but I remember going through one particular haunted house, and, um, you know, there's werewolves chasing us through the swamp, and there's steam coming up out of the swamp, and we're running through this swamp, and over draw bridges and we find ourselves in this maze and it's dark and you know these plywood walls you have your hands on these walls and the walls are getting smaller and the floor is uneven and, and you feel like you're going to throw up and you round we rounded this corner and guys i'm not kidding i saw a ghost it was a real ghost because I, I looked at this scene of this room this old 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 like you'd almost see it in a movie and there was this rocking chair in the middle of the room. And I thought, okay, no, wait, this isn't so bad because there's nobody, nobody in the room. But I'm thinking, any second, my back's against the wall, and I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just kind of scooting with my back against the wall, and I'm waiting for something to jump out. All of a sudden, I realize that the rocking chair in the middle of the room starts rocking, and there's nobody in it. I'm like, all right, this, all right, I'm done. I'm done. All of a sudden, this, this, this lady, creepy lady, might I add, appears in the rocking chair and I can see through her. And I'm like, they done hired a real ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared. I was so scared. Now, now I'm just going to fast forward before I finish the story. I, I could not sleep for weeks. I'm serious. I was so terrified because of what I saw. Where are my parents when all this is happening? Do not let your little kids go to haunted houses. Just don't do it. And so... So then I, a we, I asked my, my dad, I said, Dad, how is that real? How, how can I see through a person? It was a real ghost. It had to be, Dad. Tell me. And so my dad explained to me what a hologram is. And he starts, you know, I think dads make stuff up most of the time. But he was, he was laying out a pretty clear case. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm thinking he knows what he's talking about. So he talks about plexiglass and mirrors and lights and, and all these things. And he says, you know, there's a way to create this feeling or this perception that what you're seeing is real, but you're looking through something that isn't real at all. And I got to thinking about that when it comes to hope or hopelessness, which really isn't a mountain at all, but it's a scam. It's a hologram from hell. Right. It, you know, the enemy will cause you to think that your circumstances are permanent. Right. That's right. It, it, the enemy will cause you to think that, that your, your life is too far gone for there ever to be any hope of salvation, that you'll, you're never going to be good enough right. You're never going to be good enough to earn God's grace. The enemy will tell you that your marriage is too far gone, that there's no way that, that God could, could bless your marriage and give you something more imaginable than you could have ever possibly conjured up. Right. The enemy will, will create these holograms of hopelessness. He will cause you to think that there's no way of digging yourself out of the financial ruin that you think you're in. He will create these pictures in your mind and he will tell you there is no hope for you. Right. There, there is no way that this is going to work out. You might be a, a single mom raising your babies and you're waiting tables at night just to make ends meet and you want to go to college so bad and the enemy is telling you in your head there, there is no way that you're going to be able to do this. He lies to us and he creates this this picture, this so-called reality that isn't true at all. And he, he, his, his desire is to, try to, is to try to get us to believe the scam, to believe the lie. But today, we're going to talk about hope. Right. That hope is real. Right. And today's message is entitled, Let Hope 
rise. If you bow your heads with us this morning, we're going to pray over this message. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you are in this place. God, that hope is real, that it's here, that it exists. God, I pray today, Father, that you'd begin to open up our hearts right now. God, I pray that your presence would wrap us up wherever we're at, whatever circumstances are around us. God, I pray that our eyes would be open. I pray that our heart and our mind would be ready to receive this word. God, implant it deeply inside of us and let hope rise in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning we're going to go to the book of John, chapter 5. We're going to be looking at a story about a man who felt completely hopeless. He felt like his life had absolutely no point of being turned around. I want you to look at John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read it all the way through, then we're going to break it down. It says this, afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem from one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the gate, the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethsaida. With five covered porches, crowds of sick people, lame and paralyzed, lay on these porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Can you say 38 years? That is a long time. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always is there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9, instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. This morning, as we begin to look at this story, I want you to understand that our world is filled with people who feel like there is no hope. Everywhere you go, if you will just open your eyes, you will see a world full of people who feel like there's no hope for them. They're in a helpless situation. It's dark and it's despair. You know, the word hope, when you think about what is the meaning of hope, hope is nothing more than a desire. All right? You probably use the word hope in a day more than you realize. You make statements like, I hope my husband makes it home in time for us to make it it, to the birthday party on time. I hope that I have enough money to pay the bills at the end of this month. My daughters are both about to, I have twin girls, we do, and they're about to turn 15 in 13 days. And the girls have been telling us um, what they hope they get for their birthday. See, they're very different. One is hoping for a puppy And one is hoping for a 308. If you don't know what that is, that's a rifle, all right? Deer season is coming. They're they're very different. They're hoping. Then you can just figure out which one is which. They're hoping for these gifts, right? Does that not tell you exactly who they are? The the funny thing is, last service, I didn't didn't, um, think about it. And the girls came in. One was in the room during service. One was serving somewhere else. And she came in. She goes, what did you say? Because somebody came up to me and said, you're the 308. And she goes, what are you talking about? He was like, you want a 308 for your birthday? And she was like, nope, that's not me. That's the other. But you know the what? 308 girl, she said yesterday when she was looking at her brother's truck, that's four-wheel drive and that's jacked up. That's what she wants in yeah, a year. Yeah, she said, that's not jacked up nearly enough. That <laughs> needs to be three inches higher. She's the one that wants the jacked up truck and the 308 hanging in the back window when it used to be legal. You know what I mean? But they hope for these things. And so we use this word all the time. But guys, let me tell you something. The word of God has a different meaning for the word hope hope. All right. When we look into the word of God and we look at the biblical sense of the word, what hope is, is not just a desire. What hope is in the word of God is a confident expectation of what is to come. The word confident is there and it's so important because it is a confident expectation of what is to come. But you see this man who was laying here at this pool, he had been there for 38 years. Now, I want you to just imagine with me, he's lame, all right? So every day, someone has had to bring him to the pool. It doesn't say he lives there. It says there's five porches. And we assume there are hundreds of people that are blind and deaf and lame, paralyzed, laying here. So every day for 38 years, that is like 13,000 and some days, he's been coming here to this pool. And legend has it that, and not just legend, but they actually saw it happen, that the water would begin to spin and begin to bubble up one time a year, just once, all right? And when that happened, whoever would make it into that pool of water would receive their healing. 
Now, when you study it out, they're not really sure what caused it. Some believed it was a spring that once a year would open up and pour into this pool. And when it did, there would be those bubbles that would bring about healing. The Hebrews actually believed that it was an angel that would come down from heaven and would stir the waters. But either way, for 38 years, we only assumed that he was there and he watched 38 other people receive their healing. See, what's interesting about this pool is its literal name meant this. It meant the place of outpouring or the house of grace. It was an opportunity every time the waters begin to stir, every time the waters begin to bubble, it was an opportunity to receive their healing. Now, I want to show you something about this passage. It says that there are those crowds of people. They're all laying everywhere. We're talking hundreds of people. This dude's been there for 38 years. He's probably spent every penny he has on doctors and has given up. Yet somehow he realizes there really is healing in the water. But watch what happens. It says when Jesus saw him, he knew he had been there for a long time. Now I want you to imagine Jesus is now, this is his ministry is like up and running. He's full time. He just came from Samaria where he'd been sitting at the well and he'd been talking to the woman who had five husbands and he read her mail and said, hey, I've got water, living water, that if you'll accept it, you'll never thirst again. And the whole town of Samaria heard about Jesus. He was about doing these radical miracles that were turning heads everywhere, all right? And so when he comes on the scene, what I believe was happening is Jesus basically scans the porches. And he's like, I'm here and I'm ready to move. I'm here and I'm going to show them they don't even need this pool. They don't need the bubbles because hope has arrived on the scene. He scans the porches and he's not looking for just anybody. He's looking for the one who's in the darkest pit of despair. He's looking for the one who's been there the longest who says there's no hope for me. He's looking at the one who everybody else is wondering. I don't know why you keep coming here. 38 years you've never made it in. You're obviously not going to receive your healing. Jesus looked at that one, and the word says he saw him. And he not only saw him, he knew what he had been dealing with for 38 years. Do you know the word of God tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23 and 24, it says, can anyone hide, can anyone hide from me? Am I not everywhere? Do you not think that Jesus knows right where you are? Do you not think that Jesus sees you every moment of every day, every thought that crosses your mind, every lie that the enemy places and that you meditate upon? You go on in this passage, and Jesus asks him a question. And he says this, would you like to get well? Now, I think this is interesting because when you study the scriptures, you begin to realize Jesus oftentimes asks questions. And I think it's funny because what a stupid question. I mean, that's what I'm thinking because when you read it, it says that these people can't see, they can't hear, they can't move. They're here waiting for the waters to move and bubble up just one time a year. And they're just hoping that maybe they'll be the one that gets put in the water. And Jesus looks at the man who's been there probably the longest, and he says, would you like to get well? Now, you think, what a dumb question. You think the guy would say, well, yeah, why do you think I'm here? But that's not what he says, which is crazy. Look with us in verse 7, how the man responds. He says, I can't, sir. The sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. You know, I think for many of us, maybe you've spent such a long time in a season of so-called hopelessness that you've convinced yourself that it might be possible for some people Because remember this man, 38 years, he'd probably seen 38 people receive hope when they were, when they dipped themselves in the water or when they were carried to the water. He, He knows deep down that hope is possible, but how many times do we say, it's just not for me? It's just not something that I'm qualified 
for. It's not something that I feel like I can attain. It, hope is just not for me. It was a yes or no question that Jesus asked him. Do you want to be made well or do you not? It's a yes or no question. And I believe God might be asking you the same question today. Do you want hope for your situation or do you not? It is a yes or no question. It's either yes, Jesus, I want to be made well. I want hope. I want everything, God, that you have for me and then some. I want it all. Whatever you have, I'll take it. The answer is yes. But some of you, maybe no. I don't know why that would be the answer. But you, want, you know what his answer was? I can't. What he was saying was, of course I want to be made well. Of course I want to go down into that water. Of course I want to be able to walk. I've been like this for 38 years. What he was saying is, Jesus, he didn't know who he was talking to, see? And he said, do you not see that I can't move? Are you not realizing that, there's, that we're surrounded by all these crowds of people that are in the same situation as I am? And you're asking me if I want to be made well. Of course I want to be made well, but I can't. I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to pick me up and put me down in the water so I can be made well. But he didn't realize that he was talking to hope. He was talking to the hope giver. He didn't realize he didn't need the water. He was talking to the ultimate source of hope. And he was looking right past him and he was looking at the water. Jesus could have made him well in that moment. But instead of saying, yes, I want to be made well, he said, I can't. He was making excuses as to why hope wouldn't find him that day. How often do you make excuses about your situation? How often do you you look at your circumstances and you build this case as to why, though it might be able to happen for other people, it can't happen for you? you. How often do you do that? I think it even bleeds into the way we pray. Honestly, I think sometimes we cut ourselves short of the bigger things that God wants to do, the the bigger things that God is able to do. But I think because we limit ourselves mentally, we've already shortcut ourselves when we go to pray. We're like, God, you know, if, you know, if, if that's what you want, you know, or, um, God, I just, you know, Sometimes I think we ask him for less. Then in our mind, deep down, we're thinking, man, I, I, you see the moon. But you don't ask for it because you don't believe that it's really possible for you. Right. We make these excuses. We look at our circumstances and we buy the lie that the enemy sells us. And we make these, these excuses as to why God can't give us hope for our situation for where we're at. Notice he says, I have no one. To put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. I think sometimes we convince ourselves that we're all alone. Which I think is interesting because how did he make it to the pool of Bethesda every morning if he was lame? Somebody had to have carried him. So we know that there was someone in his life or people in his life that was willing to help him every day go and sit by the pool of Bethesda. There was people in his life that helped him to establish that daily routine. Even though as crippled as he felt, there's people that helped him to get to where he needed to be. And in your life, you're making these excuses, but what you don't realize is that there are people that have hope in your life that are all around you, and you just can't even see it because of all the excuses, that you're, these roadblocks that you're throwing. All you can do is focus on the excuses of why it can't happen for you when you have to realize that God has put the people that you need in your life that have the hope when you would just let them help you and realize how much you have. You know, that's why we have life groups. I'm just going to tell you, man, when you get into a life group, you're surrounding yourself with people that believe in hope. And you rub shoulders with people that are like-minded. And you begin to open yourself up to believe that there's something bigger than than what you've accepted in your life. But you see, every day, where was he at? He was at these porches by the pool with all these people that were just like him. All these people that were in the same situation he was. There was people that were sick. 
There's people that were, that were deaf or blind, lame, paralyzed. All of these people had the same condition. They were in the same situation. Many of them felt like for themselves there was no hope. And when you surround yourself with people like that day in and day out, you're going to begin to buy the lie. You're going to begin to think that there's no hope for you. When, when you start saying, I can't, realize that Jesus says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Stop saying you can't when God says you can. He says you can. And you just keep shortcutting yourself, saying I can't, I can't. I can't, never could. Grandpa ever tell you that one? I can't, never could. Stop saying I can't. Have you guys ever played on on an athletic team and you said I can't in front of the coach and that coach made you run your guts out? Right? Why, are you, why would a coach sit idly by and let one player infect the mentality of the entire team by saying, I can't? Our kids uh, had an incredible uh, kindergarten teacher by the name of Mrs. Hardesty. And she would make them write their name. Um, and if they ever said, I can't, she would like, you'd think World War III just broke out. She said if there's, at the beginning of every year, she would say there's something that we're not going to ever, 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 ever say in this classroom, and that is, I can't. But instead, you need to say, I'll try. You know, we could so apply that to our lives every day. I, you know, and, and the truth is, we can't. But God can. And he brings us hope, and we're not alone He's calling us to believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is hope, right? There is hope. I think if maybe you're dealing with an addiction, you say, I, I can't break the addiction of, of pornography because it's just so accessible. It's just, it's, I can't do it. It's right here on my phone. I can't do it. You might say, I can't, I can't keep going because the things are never going to change. I can't stop drinking. I can't, and you just fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you're saying in your mind, I can't, I can't stop this because, and you fill in the blank, and you give an excuse as to why things will never get better. But the reality is, Jesus is standing right in front of you, and he's saying, do you want to be made well or not? The answer is yes. I do want to be made well. Give me whatever you have, Lord. And make me whole. You know, every day we're surrounded by people who feel like this man who'd been there for 38 years. He had given up hope that his circumstances would change. Today, as we're wrapping up, we want to end with this thought, and that is, if you have hope, will you spread the hope? You see, my question for you is this, and I I have been pondering this myself for the last few days. Can God interrupt your schedule? You see, for those of us who have hope, we're driven by a purpose. If you have hope on the inside of you, you wake up when the alarm goes off and you know what you're about to do. You're going to be in your word. You're going to be fueling yourself. You're going to be going out. You're going to be going into the workplace. You're going to be going out looking for success. You're driven by whatever your goals are that God has placed upon you. You live with a purpose. But so often those of us who are full of hope are so driven by our own purpose and by our own task list and our own to-do list that we can't even be interrupted to see that there are people like this lame man who for 38 years he needed someone to allow their schedule to be interrupted, to come to the pool and put him in. You see, when you begin to look around our community, you begin to realize, as Brandon said last week, that we live in a culture in a day and a time where we are more connected because of technology and social media, and you feel like you got thousands of friends, right, man? You got all these friends, but yet you feel all alone. People are suffering in their minds all alone, feeling like there's no help because they have no one to turn to. Do you ever look at someone and realize there's not a glimmer in their eye? And do you take the time to say, hey, how's things going? And mean it. Or do you look the other way because you think, my gosh, I got 10 more things to do. I do not have time for that kind of a conversation. You see, that day Jesus went looking 
for the one that didn't have any hope. He went looking for the one who knew he couldn't get into that water all by himself. You see, when Jesus came down the first time, he came from heaven to earth. Why? To bring about hope. You see, when he went to the cross, he didn't just go to cover your sins. He stretched out his hands, and yes, he brought forgiveness to sin, but there was a bigger purpose. He went into that grave for three days. Why did he do that? He went to hell with the keys because he was going there to overcome death and despair, which is hopelessness. He went there. He did what he came to do, and three days later, he rose from that grave doing what? Producing hope for all humanity. If you've accepted Jesus, that hope should be radiating from the inside of you. But can God interrupt your schedule? You see, in our community, it's ridiculous, guys. Three people, Brad said in 10 days too, but guys, since August, three people have taken their life. Why? Because they felt like there was no hope. How many of us walked past those people? How many of us didn't take the time to stop and let the hope of Jesus Christ radiate out of our lives? Do you know whether or not you're passing people in the halls at work who are without hope? Do you know when you're in your schools, are there people you're passing without hope and you're thinking, you know what? I'm not going to say how are you because I really don't care nor do I have time. See, at the end of this life, all the success that I acquire really doesn't matter. If today is my last day on this earth, the amount of money I have in my bank account today doesn't matter. If today is the last day I breathe on this earth There won't be a hearse following me in a couple days with all the things that I've acquired in this life. But what will matter when I get to heaven are the people that I spread the hope to that might be there as well because I was willing to let God interrupt my schedule. This man had no hope if it wasn't going to be for someone else picking him up. Do you know there's another parable of a man who was laying on a mat, lame, And there were four guys who said, we're going to take you to Jesus. You see, there was an opportunity when the water began to stir. There was this man, Jesus, and he'd been doing miracles. And they said, we're going to take you. And they got to the back door and they realized this place is crowded and there's no worship host to get him through the crowd. So we're going up on the roof. We're not giving up on this person. How many times in your life have you nearly given up on somebody else? Because you're thinking, I've invited them 10 million times and they never came to the house of hope. They've never come to the house of grace. I'm going to stop bugging them. You know what's going to happen when you stop bugging them? You are giving up on them, but you're the one that has the hope. You see, those guys went up to the top of the roof. They rolled back the roof, and they began to lower this man right in front of Jesus. There are people in your life, and you may be the only one with hope that's in front of them. Will you let God interrupt your schedule? I'm going to challenge you this week. Every person you come in contact with is an opportunity. Well, I don't know what to say, Misty. You don't have to say anything. How about we start by putting a smile on your face? Everybody smile at me. It's easier to preach when you're smiling. Smiling is contagious. You know what it says? It says there's something on the inside of me that is different than what have the, the rest of the world has. When I was 15 years old, I remember somebody telling me, you may not have the right words, but just smile. Do you know what? If you have hope, you're worst day on earth here with hope is the best day that they have. Listen to me. You can go around through the halls. You can smile. You can make a difference. Do you know you can just stop and tell someone, hey, I don't know what you're going through, but I just want you to know I'm praying for you. You could go a step farther and you could pray, but heaven forbid that'd be way out of your comfort zone. Guys, people need the hope that you have. If Jesus is alive inside of you, people should know it. If Jesus is really alive inside of you, then you should be radiating and spreading that hope. Because guys, we're surrounded by people that lay their head on their pillows at night and pray they don't wake up. Because they don't see any hope. But we can change that. That's why we're here. That's why Jesus came. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father, I thank you today that you loved us so much, that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, and you came 
to bring hope. Lord, where would any of us be today if it wasn't for you? God, I pray today that those that are in this room and hear the sound of my voice, if you're here today and you feel hopeless, you feel like the circumstances surrounding you are be out of your control, there, there is no hope, you feel helpless and within despair, I want to tell you today that this is a lie from the pit of hell. It's not reality. The fact is, Jesus can turn any situation around. But we have to be willing to let him. And if you're here today and you're full of hope, then my prayer is that you'd begin to pray, God, interrupt my schedule. I challenge you to pray that prayer. Many of you probably won't because you don't want him to. But I'm telling you right now, we need to begin to pray, God, interrupt my schedule. Let me begin to spread the hope to those that I pass day in and day out who lay their head on their pillow at night and feel like there's no reason to wake up the next morning. God, I pray that you would empower us with your strength, God, to spread the message of hope. If you're here today and you would say to yourself, I feel that hopeless feeling. I don't have a real relationship with Jesus. That's where hope starts. By you simply saying, I don't know how this is all going to turn around, but I need Jesus. If you're here today and you would say, I need Jesus, I need a real relationship with him. I want hope in my life. I want you to just raise your hand quickly, throw your hands in the air. Right now, I see your hand. Anybody else? You want hope. You want a real relationship. Amen. I see your hands. Anybody else? Because we're in this moment. God can turn it all around if you're just willing to give it to him. Church, will you pray together with those right now who are going to make this decision to invite Jesus to be the Lord of their life? Will you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the things I've done wrong. God, I believe that you overcame death, hell, and the grave to give me hope. I just ask that you would allow me to spread that hope to the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, that is the best decision you will ever make in your life. And six people this morning have already given their lives to Christ. This is a gift. Come on, celebrate. This green bag is a gift that we like to give. It's called our next step kit because we believe that you need to know what to do next after you pray that simple little prayer because God really will, really will radically turn your life around. Pick one up at the left door as you exit. And if you're online, direct message us your address and we'll have one in the mail to you in the morning. Guys, put your hands together one more time for those who have given their life to Christ. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.